Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Complaints Truck. I am joined, as always, by Nymera and Genos, or Genos, from One Punch Man. <laughs> That's a good one, actually. Yeah, that is good. Yeah, I like that. You, oh, you enjoy having the, the cybernetic cannons and stuff? Okay, mm -hmm. I want to throw this out there. There was a really fun point in time where both My Hero Academia and One Punch Man both aired at a very similar time, and there was this beautiful blissful moment when no one really knew that much about them and like the fandoms kind of fucking ruined it for everyone because like they were both these really fun different takes on the superhero genre which anime is not really done like superhero like as well they hadn't done it as much up until that point where like Mario Academia was a very straight laced this is kind of like well not quite golden age of heroes but you know it's a much more kind of like down the middle kind of um, style of like traditional heroing and then One Punch Man is a complete parody of the genre whilst also hitting a lot of the same notes and they coexisted really really well that was like a good time and then and then fandoms happened and now it's quite hard to follow either of them but, yeah, I'm, yeah I'm still I'm on the blonde mech era at the moment still for Kira as obviously he was you know Alphonse uh, Elric last time so we're keeping it keeping it mech True. based here. I have been tempted once upon a time actually to watch uh, One Punch Man because it's a my, good parody. It's a really good parody. My brother, who does not like anime, mm. never watches anime ever. Like the only things he's seen is like you know Studio Ghibli <laughs> stuff or whatever. He was like, oh, it's actually it's on Netflix. It's actually pretty good. I was surprised. Blah, blah, blah. But I will not be watching it because, as you now know, Nymera, I am into my movies only era. I do not. Wait, how touch. many episodes are in the first season? I will say, don't watch season two of One Punch Man. You're, Punch, you're movies only now. Yeah, well, when, short when it comes series to and short movies. series and movies only. It has if it's to be more than twelve short. episodes. Yeah. Well, if it's twelve, if it's twelve or fewer episodes, Kira, then you know who knows? It could still be on the cards. Bro, but you, uh... I cannot believe you have shown up that public service announcement. Right? Imagine I was like going to go to you. Right? Okay, here I'm going to recommend to you fantasy movies, right? And you'd be like, what would you recommend as the best fantasy movie? Right, Lord of the Rings, obviously. Oh, too long, I'm not gonna watch it. That That is literally you with anime, because the best animes, right, all the really good ones are outside your limitations. You're denying yourself the Lord of the Rings of anime by being like, oh, it's too long, too many episodes. It doesn't have a dog. <laughs> Difference way, being it. that, at, like, fantasy, high Don't fantasy say. does not have the same, like, base level of terrible as anime has. So it's not really the same thing, is it? Well, you know, I, I, I actually don't. Say... I watched the Underworld's, uh, Underworld's movie yeah, recently. That's not, and my that's God, not, that's are they fucking, fucking so high fantasy, uh, though, I, is it? But it's right. Fantasy, so this is the problem with, like, oh, Gulf's a good fucking example of this. It's like whenever you're listening to modern music, right? You're like, oh, God, music's so fucking awful. It's like, no, I mean, if you think music was better like 20, 30 years ago, you're just forgetting the bad stuff. Only the good stuff has survived through to this kind of era. Yeah, exactly. Fantasy has been a lot, been around a lot longer than like, well, anime's been around for a while, but even then, like, it's been a lot, fantasy's been around for so much longer in like, the, particularly the Western conscience than, um, conscious than, than anime has. So we just remember a lot more of the good stuff. But this um, is the also, thing, though. There's there are zero humans on Earth who are like coming up to me and saying, "Bro, you really need to watch the remake of Total Recall." Like those humans do not exist. They and they certainly don't have entire Reddit well, and fans. Well, because when people get into the anime, they assume that no one is watching. It's like oh, this is a new thing, and I'm so knowledgeable about this thing, which no one's watched. I'm like, buddy, I have watched like six. Hey, there's there is there is nothing. Do not. <laughs> there's nothing on Earth that compares to anime when it comes to people just recommending trash out of the fucking woodwork that they insist is like brilliant. Kira's <laughs> example of like Lord of the Rings is more like saying like, hey. Do you like orange juice? Try apple juice. And it's like, okay, even though I don't like cranberry juice, for example, a lot of fruit juice you know, is pretty good. <laughs> anime not... is like, oh, bro, do you like the taste of like animal blood? And I'm be like, uh, yeah, no, probably not. It's like, what about monkey blood? Yeah, no, still probably not. It's like, okay, what about this random super specific like black pudding that's from a Michelin star enough, restaurant? I have quite okay, fond maybe memory. one in a million. No, no, like... Because it's like, if you were to ask someone, right, okay, I've got like patrician taste. My taste and things are insane, right, okay? And if I'm telling you it's good, even I'll be like, all of anime is mid as hell. Like the whole realm, like One Piece, mid as hell, Naruto, Medicine, I'm going to be waving Dragon my fucking Z, Gintama Medicine, flag over here for a, right? year a fucking day, by the way. Okay, but like, the, the, some, the stuff that I reckon that, 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 that's actually like good, slash there's some stuff that's very, very, very good, like, it's Kino. Like, it's, and then you reply, when you hit me with that, oh, it's too many episodes, I'm just like, ah! 
Okay, by the way, bit, bit of a tangent, I saw a really funny, uh, well no, a very on-point post, like, the other day, which is like, there is a narrative and, like, a technology kind of, like, kind of, like, cross-grid, effectively, in terms of sci-fi to fantasy. You have technology of fantasy to sci-fi, and you have um, narrative of fantasy to sci-fi. I thought it was really interesting in terms of, like, looking through, like, some of the big projects of all time, because you do have Lord of the Rings, which is very much fantasy genre, fantasy setting, fantasy narrative. You have something like Star Trek, which is sci-fi narrative, and very much sci-fi kind of technology as well. Then you get into weird shit, like Star Wars is a sci-fi in terms of technology. It is not a sci-fi when it comes to, like, na like narrative at all. It's a space opera, that's why it's not really a sci-fi. Yeah, it's, so it's got it's, fancy it's, narrative, yeah. and it's got that. And what I found really interesting, because this is one of my favorite book series of all time, um, in terms of, like, what is fantasy in terms of technology, be sub but sci-fi in regards to his narrative, is Discworld. Because basically everything that is, like, I'm gonna use magic to construct, like, real-world uh, social social issues of our time and explain it to you in magical terms, but then you realize it's something which relates to your life. And I just found that really fun. And then you have something like Disco Elysium, which is just fucking weird and every kind of, and it kind of gets across the whole grid. Yeah, I bought fun. that in the Steam sale because it was it's like fantastic. one pound so or something. So I was like, I have oh, to yeah, get that. Oh yeah, it's like four quid. Um, oh yeah, there. if it's still on there and you're, you're watching this and by the time you're watching this, it's still there. Disco Elysium might be the best voice acted and best dialogue written game ever. That shit, like even though it's a modern game, that is in like at least my top five of RPGs of all time. Absolutely insane. Like, it's actually that... an RPG. Yeah, it's 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 fucking incredible. That 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 game is is so well crafted. It's really the good. best written dialogue that I've ever ever seen in a game. Anyway, uh, bottom line is obviously Lord of the Rings still entirely based, and ninety nine percent of anime is utter shit. Although, as you might that know, is, that is true. One hundred percent, that is true. Yeah, uh, that is true. <laughs> uh, as Nymera might know, I did watch. I had I had to take a break for my brain and mental health from. Yeah, what did you watch recently? You watched something else. Uh, I watched Suzumi, but. I will talk about that them. on uh, EuroLeague because... Okay, know, give me some time but, to watch it, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and for whatever reason, apparently EuroLeague is the show when, you know, we talk of review anime, not this show. So it is what it is. And also because I have a user question for you both from someone called Scrambled Toast. Great name, by the way. Top name. Uh, and they ask... Which single player? I, okay, this isn't well grammared. Great name, but not great grammar. I think the, what, what they mean is. I thought yeah, I struggle with that as well. Which single player, as in a single move of a player, would you do to improve a team the most? And let's assume they're talking about LCK here. So, which single move would you make of a player from one team to another? Would you do to improve a team by the biggest uh... margin? Well, I think we have to. I think we might need to stratify this out into different, um, like different uh, uh, criteria. I think there should be one which is just moving from LCK right now to LCK right now, and then open up to like any player. Because yeah. I think those two answers will be different. Because I'm immediately thinking of like some LPL players moving over to LCK, like Kanavi, maybe mm. improving a team or something like that. I think we or should scout. ban just saying putting Chovy on like fucking yeah, 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 that's the problem. Or Cho something. Yeah, that's Cho yeah, Chovy to any team is like the ultimate floor raising. Yeah. Like, so let's exclude no. Chovy. Well, well, no, no, but the, mm. I think in that case, I think what it has to be is like most improvement for the player and for the team as well. Because Chovy moving anywhere else is a downgrade for Chovy, but is it? Yeah. So is Ooh. there a player which benefits? I've both? got one. Yeah. You, uh, it, like basically, if you just take like um, you take like Fishlets, Foshek off of KT. So if you put like um, Cuz right, no Peanut. You put K Peanut onto KT. Put Peanut on KT with BDD, Deft, and yeah, that's actually really good. That's yeah, like that's like I was thinking Cuz though because I think Cuz? he's more. I think I think he's more variable. I think this guy has been pretty great. Yeah, yeah but like just for like what KT like KT want to do. Like KT loves to set in lanes. Wait, wait, hang like, on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Would you you know what would be even better? Like out of what coach would you move to KT? Just just move a coaching staff to KT. <laughs> no, that'd, okay, that'd, 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 argue, not moving. That, that'd arguably be even better. That would I be think, better, but it was player. I think Cuz would be a great shout because it, as Nymera says, as they're quite sort of. ISO lane centric having like Cos can play like the sort of an inspired style Viego for example where he's just like power farming can actually like pop off on a carry I feel like Peanut now can only really play like the facilitative stuff realistically like no it's just style like he level. plays like Nedley but it's like a Peanut style of like lane yeah, facilitating but... Nedley 
Yeah, I guess. I mean, I'm, I'm true, usually but... the peanut hater, but I think it's a really, really good fit. Like the downside of something like um, the, the downside of something like Cuz is like you would have to have it that when you like add like Cuz, you wouldn't be like having like your bot lane just be like playing for like Cuz, which is like something that happens in like so many different um like teams like Death like Zon. He's got like that not problem. I, I don't even know if it's Death or coaching staff that do it, but lots of teams that Death is on, he ends up becoming a, like a facilitator ADC like prey when Death is just best as like a hyper carry. Even though he could do both, it, but it's like just an absolute way. It's like taking Uzi and telling him you're going to play like prey. I don't think I'm all at a point in doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Who else? What about supports? What, like, what's the support that, that like? Is there any absolutely horrendous supports right now? Oh um, wait, delight! If you took delight for swap delight and Kellen, uh, yeah, that could potentially. But delight I mean, is literally the reason that like Hamwa Life loses like a shit ton of games. By the way, he is yeah. really awful at the moment. Yeah, I, I I'm. It's, I think it's too early to like reclassify him as a bad player, but he's on the track. <laughs> like it's. It's it's not I, I don't want to just make out that he's a bad player, but I'm talking about improving, like, yeah, yeah, what would yeah, be yeah. the biggest improvement you know, right now. I look at Hamwell Life's, like, hmm. biggest problems, and it is literal mechanical and positional errors from from Delight. Like, those are the biggest, like, problems. I, and I couldn't move anyone else. Who's, like, an absolute terrible team? I mean, I feel like, okay, you, there are some angles to say about Doran, but, like, I think Doran's really good at his tank play, but I think his carry play has been, like, a little bit sus. So if you want to index in towards more of that... Maybe there's an angle there. I, You know what? In terms of like mid-table to mid-table, bottom table to bottom table, I still have a bit of belief in Rascal, even though it's a shit team. Could you move like Rascal to like Quangdon over, over Dudu? Do you think that'd be an upgrade? It's weird. Like, like, maybe, Dudu, like, maybe I'm... Yeah, Dudu's actually not playing badly. But yeah, He's it's fine. Like... It's just, I'm trying to... Because what I'm trying What's to think of is like... The, like in terms of like... Brian? Yeah, this oh, is the thing. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying Any to think Genji of like... <laughs> player. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah, that's the problem. It's like I'm trying to think of something which would like upgrade something from bottom table to bottom table or bottom table to mid table or something like that. Because it's not really interesting talking about top t- teams going anywhere. Like, I mean, you could, you know, what we could do like a really like controversial one and say like I think that T1 might be better right now um, with like delight instead of carrier or something like that. Uh, because I think that T1 have huge problems with the way they're frontlining. Still, I think they're not good at tank play. I think if you end up replacing Particularly carrier with a better tank support. I mean, Lahan's obviously Lahan's on a good day could potentially do that. That could be interesting because obviously I think between Genji and T1, could you make a move that improves one of the teams? Um, yeah. I think you can do with obviously the style of players there. But I, I actually think that carrier is not very good at playing tank. He's great at playing tanks as initiators, but not playing tanks as front lines. And I think someone like Delight, maybe Lahan's, you know, well, Lahan's obviously, maybe they could do better in the current meta. Now, I don't think it would work at Tion's peak strength, but I think for the style they're playing right now, there's also an option for that as well. Just because I think Carrier is much better on burst and like his his more weird shit champions rather than like standard uh, tanky stuff. But who was the who was the player who had the worst? Ca- Canyon was on it Guga was the worst teams. player and worst. What Guga was the worst player in the LCK? Yeah, he was. Fucking oh yeah, awful. he was pretty bad. Right, yeah. so Gu- Guga is the worst player in the LCK, and his roster is like two and six. So if you take Guga and we swap him with like. Anyone doesn't that make is that is that, big, is that the biggest jump up? The for problem is, I mean, there I mean okay, been, if you're like, gonna do it from, but if you're gonna Kellen do it from out of region, just stand out. You just like think so. What you can do is like no, if you want to do, if, if, if you just want to in, in if you want to invite a player from another region, just bring back fucking Kyle or something like that. And you just put him onto one of these scenes because Kyle's playing mm. like fucking great right now. I'm just bringing Cro- Croco and and Kyle from like anyone's legends somewhere. But I feel like that that kind of like goes against the spirit of the question. I, well. I'm really yeah. big on fish lips. I, I think if you take fish lips, Fosjek off of KT, and you give them like one of the Canyon. top three junglers, Canyon, <laughs> Owner, mm-hmm. um, Peanut, even like you guys, Cuz, but one Cuz, I would say Peanut. But any of those three, yeah, that, they're, they're both valid. Yeah. Yeah. Then I think um, I think Kate, you would see a completely different KT because they, mm. they are so warped by Pick Ban and that that, that guy, <laughs> that man, <laughs> that thing. Right, but anyway, so let's talk about uh, a team who are fresh off winning EWC, uh, you know, beating down top esports, uh, apparently sent their heads spinning for a, for a hot second as well. Uh, T1, who, well, this past week dropped a game to Ooh. bloody Breon and then lost to Anwar. Uh, 
So yeah, I mean, I would say that Hanwha series like could have gone either way. Like a couple of those games were like super close, messy games, game one and game three. Um, so it's not, you know, it's a best of three. It's regular season. You know, it's not the be all and end all. But this is certainly not the T1 that we expected after having kept their rosters together after winning Worlds. Um, and, you know, even off EWC, uh, I know they had a slightly sus game uh, sort of series against Liquid. But to be honest, again, Liquid are actually just quite a good team. And they did get through that. And they did beat down uh, top esports. I mean, we saw Faker playing bloody Yasuo. Like, it seemed like they were, you know, improving, expanding their pools, all, all the rest of it. But, I mean, what, first of all, Nymera, what do you make of T1 at the minute? What's going on? What are the problems and ailments? Where do they go from so, here? If we're taking what we said about them before, one of the big things which I brought up is that, and we said it again just in the intro as well in regards to the, the, to the viewer question, in regards to which move would make the, mo make, make the biggest difference to a team. I think that T1 needs a good tank player. I think that owner is the best tank player for frontline that they have. Um, and I don't think that Carrier and Zeus are specifically good at playing tanks to not die and buy space. I think they are good at using tanks to use them as threatening objects to engage on the enemy team, and in the case of Cassante, look for like um, like big 1v1s there, but I don't think they're very good tank players. And I think what this ends up evolving into is the fact that in the current meta, I think in LCK, there are about two schools of teams in terms of the top teams and the way that they team fight. There are a class of teams, I think DK fall into this, I think maybe KT fall into this as well, which are better at playing shorter team fights, which are determined by the end, the like opening salvo, first combo, killing off people and winning the fight in the first kind of combo. I think particularly DK are in that combo, in that list, and and it's a spectrum, right? It's kind of like one to it's not like hard hard on the other side. And then you have a whole bunch of teams which are much better around playing around. Um, Double duty frontline, handing off kind of like taking HP chunks to each other and just making sure there's a wall in front of them. Playing out teams a lot slower and kind of playing for slower old team fights where they have multiple tanks which can buy space for their carries. I think HLE are part of this. I think that Gen G are largely part of this too because they are very, very good at playing frontline. But Gen G can kind of do anything. So again, like they're, they're kind of like whatever. I still think they're better at the slow fights than the fast fights, but they're very good at both. I think T1 are largely better around playing around burst than they are around playing around tank. And I think that this is a huge issue for them is because I think that the schedule schedule is not gone for six because they were they were out out in Riyadh for the longest of all all the teams um, in LCK. Uh, they've had a ridiculous schedule for forever, and I. I, I'm starting to like question the T1 management in regards to like I know you have to monetize your teams, your your players, but like holding them to an idle like schedule is not helping this team. Alongside the fact that their practice has also been like dunking on them too because of the fucking DDoS issues and stuff. I think that they are not on point enough to play the heavy burst style because I think they've taken the edge off of their top level of play because we mentioned this in the previous episode as well. And I think that with schedule and blah blah blah, we I think it even wanted like the po like the post game cons as comms as like I think it was the T1 bro game. Um, like, the last game, Kerry's like, can we just end? And he's, like, almost falling asleep on stage kind of thing. Reminds me of when they played the Red Bull League of Their Own thing, where it actually, I'm, I'm pretty sure that Kerry almost fell asleep while playing the game because they had so little sleep. Um, and I think what that means is that T1, when they're playing towards high burst, very precise initial combo style, haven't quite managed to hit the marks which they'd like, which means that the team fights drag out. And that means when you go up against teams like HLE, which are really good at drawn-out fights on the whole, because I do think that... Um, I think that Peanut is really good at just like playing that kind of like double duty, um, kind of like team fighting kind of style when you have like Peanut, Delight, Doran, like all like handing off team fight kind of tanking duty to each other when like one of them takes a chunk, okay, then one the other one takes their space in the front line and they're kind of like playing around this kind of style. So like the tanks are just kind of getting maximum value. I think T1 are not good enough right now to play the bursty fights to deny them that slow fight. And that's been the big thing which I've noticed there. The way they get away with this is that T1's preferred style is, well, or rather they, the way they should get away with this, and I think what they should be indexing to, because this is what they did um, at EWC, and I'm really surprised they haven't gone towards this. We saw a little bit of it. It's like, just play for winning lanes. Where are the pocket picks? Where's the stuff which is, like, going to demand, like, people banning it because it's such a, a good counter and stuff like that? I think the Caitlyn Braun was okay, because Goom is obviously historically great Caitlyn. But, like, I'm not seeing, like... The huge things out of particularly Zeus. Zeus, I don't I don't see like the big top lane counter picks anymore to like break open the meta. And that bot lane, I don't want to see them on this area as much, even though Goomer is better than he was. It's just not the style I want to see, because it's a slower roll team fight. It's not the bursty kind of team fight. Faker's been like blind picking shit and he's doing his job for the team. But when this would work before and don't get me wrong, I don't even think Faker's been on obviously he's not been on great form. He'd like jumped in as level 18 Tristan and just randomly died. <laughs> but if he's blind picking champ champions to like get push and control the mid jungle and give pressure to the rest of the map, the way that they won worlds last year, which is what he was doing with the Azir Oriana, 
uh, and whatever. Like, you need to make sure that your side lanes, your top lane and your TV2 have the, the, the worthy counter picks or power picks to work with that as well. Because, like, this is how this team functions. The fact that they don't have the power counter picks to, like, give themselves these hugely winning lanes, which allow them to play the best style which T1 does, means that they fall into, like, this much less opportune version of the, of the meta for C1. I think like that that's a lot of what's come to the head right now. I think that basically actually showed that T1 are not at the level of form right now to play out short form fights well enough to deny a longer form fight from teams which are really good at them. And that's why I think some teams have had better games against them. Yeah. Uh, and as I sort of mentioned in, in the intro to this um, topic, I don't think it should be overstated like this series because obviously HLE are a good team. It's not like they're some bums or something. And it was no, a very really close good. series, which T1 could have won very quickly, by the way, on the um, the point that you made and have previously made, which I think is, is quite um, interesting about how T1 as a group and as players do are sort of treated and seen in that sort of a K K pop realm or whatever. I do it's really good economically, but <laughs> yeah, but I do think, you know what else would I think would, would have been almost equally as good economically and probably better sort of long-term both for the players, the teams, and it maybe even the brand. Cause obviously T1 historically, they've always had like strong academies and stuff like this for something like the red bull event. They should have just sent like the challenger team and maybe sent like, faker to play like one yeah. game on stage and do some That's interviews and wave or whatever i don't know like you if you if, for example if let's say they did it um this time around right there's an there's a rebel event at the end of the year or whatever and they send t1 um with reckless and they also have like faker who plays one game or something but doesn't scrim or whatever and he's just there for pr i like i think these players need more of a rest. I think they're probably the I most agree. worked yeah. players in the industry. And even though the best of course, team always will be, but that, sure. that's just the nature of it. They get invited to more events and they have more press and shit. Yeah. Sure. But even though, um, as you say, obviously it's not going to be quite the same as if all of the T1 starting roster are there or whatever, it's going to be like 70% of that. And, you know, the team get well earned breaks. So I don't know. I, I, was, I wasn't a fan even at the time when um, the full T1 roster went straight to fucking paris or wherever it was in november i thought that was a bit overkill but um yeah kira what do you what do you make of t1 at the moment by the way i would also just say for me at least in like this past week particularly in like the hle series we've ragged on carrier quite a lot this season um fake has been inconsistent i think it's fair to say but i actually felt in the hle series owner and zeus were probably the biggest culprits like i, I do not think they had yes for me yeah, I do not think they had good good series at all. What do you think, Kira? This is one of these weird things, okay, where where you get you okay, because this this happens when with both players like Canyon, like Knight, Chove, where like with owner was like hitting like the high, high highs, and then they like come down from it. The butterfly like effect of um of the irregular, like how because of how regular it was for like owner, when the irregularity of it like starts to come back, you begin to other see how other people's flaws are like interconnecting and they're not like covering up for each other. Like one of the great things about T one uh World twenty twenty three is that the act a lot of the players, even though some of them had flaws, they all covered for each other flaws and the metas helped cover for each other flaws very effectively and they had like a crescendo peak. Um, that's not really happening for the full squad right now. Um, and they're really relying on like a lot of like in uh, their style, which they always like have, um, and also their like uh and individual players. And when that bar begins to like move like a smidge, like you begin to see like can have like massive like knock on effects. Um, you know, uh, the, like um Zeus being able to like play out like winning like lanes and like having like counter picks like that used to be like a hallmark of like T1 as Nightmare says we've now taken that away T1 have all now had to completely like change like draft setups like picks like what types of like champions that they're going to have how they're going to approach like the game so you're talking about it in the context of the HLE series yeah I, I think owner was like worse right but it's that full thing of like, yeah, owner was like worse, but like, owner being worse is like understandable because like where he was at was like not that sustainable um in terms of like individual like performances like just like game to game to game and a lot of it more down was like, um because owner was worse you began to like see some of the flaws like 
um, T ones like bot lane like is no longer able to like aggressively like play out when in situations. Career roam timings are just like in general across the average, are just not like as good. I think he had like some really good, like good plays, like big plays and stuff, but it still has its own like problems that it, like it still like it does supply. Um, Faker I think just had like a bad series. Um, it doesn't help that like one of the games was just sent to the abyss with the with the um. Uh, the Tristana play so there's all, like a lot of like different things you can and I wouldn't really want to just like pinpoint it like directly onto like on owner because what's really weird to me is that like T1's been together for like a long long time and like what they're good at is like super super like defined but they, they never actually the, the weaknesses that they have they don't tend to ever like shore them up and like um so, like to give an like an example, when like uh T one like uh overload like, the side of like a map, like they like put like a numbers advantage on like the side of that, sometimes they'll try and like do it greedy where they'll put like Korea and owner like opposite sides rather than like together as a jungle support and they'll like get caught and like so like Korea will move, get caught and chunk, and then because Korea's then chunked and came off the map, that side lane then like has to, can't play as aggressively, and then that like where he's been chunked from can then move, knowing that he's on reset and push like people out of a vision qu quadrant, and like you get in there, and that just that little like disconnect between like owner or that amount of greed could be greed, could be a disconnect, could be miscommunication, could be anything. But that little sequence there, it looks like not a lot, but that can have like big like knock-on effects in terms of like how to play the game. And it's something I've never seen T1 really improve at. And it's like a tendency of theirs I see, not like all the time, but it's weird that it's never really been like like worked on. So I'm I, I'm not all too sure. I, the weird thing about like T1 is it doesn't really matter like how they're um They've they've not got the fanatic property right in terms of like inconsistency. They've got the fanatic property in terms of like the variance and how quickly they can move their form is like the most extreme almost of every any team. As in like they can go from being like losing to HLE regularly BO5 form like it didn't even look close to like can win worlds can be any team in BO5 can be like a contender at any point in time like form and, and like trying to like pick out when that is going to be is very weird because I don't think anyone would have said them coming out of ESWC we're going to play this poorly in LCK like yeah. I, I, I I don't know anyone I mean, who thought that I think the, the only thing I'd sort of push back on a little bit is I actually felt like in this series um, bot lane and um, Faker I mean Faker obviously had the ridiculous W into five people but I don't actually think they played that badly. I thought what was kind of weird was that Zeus, because owner, I mean, it's always hard to tell like how much is of one and how much is causation or whatever, but because owner didn't seem to have control of topside jungle, Zeus was not dealing with that additional pressure well at all. Like he could, obviously his, he was getting- His weak side play was terrible. Yeah, he was right? getting gang, ganged up on obviously, but he was not dealing with it. You know, if that was Wonder, you know, he'd be a uh, dip dive, do dodging, whatever. But, you know, Zeus can't, can't keep up with the heat, I guess. But also I felt like Ona was losing, he was getting like hard invaded and camped in like even jungle matchups. Like this was not like some super oppressive dueling jungler or something that was getting shoved in by it was like sejuani poppy matchups and stuff like this they were just, mm. yeah, but that, were just that overloading is a top side but that is then... a dueling jungler and the sejuani matchup because the way poppy like works as you can think of it as, like you can play the poppy sure, but it, it's not it's not super oppressive though is my point no, you shouldn't no, just be able to walk no, in and take no, everything it, from him it, it, but it depends. It, it can be really oppressive. Like, like, and we saw it a lot last year. It's not really been apparent. No, yeah, but like, yeah. not that the just because we've seen it less, I don't think the principle mm. has changed. As in, like, I think uh, if a poppy like gets you into certain situations on like tank champ, she can be like really, really impressive, and it can be really hard to actually get back into jungle quadrants regularly against her. Like when Razork was like playing it, it was like I had to be perma banned mm. against him because people just categorically did not want to play. Dude, do you remember into, the, like, way, the way way poppy for way but last year that was fucking cracked man oh, yeah and, and, but like the full thing about like <clears throat> poppy is is like if the game goes like against you she has the exact same problem because her like her engages her in form of engage is such hard to commit like but like when you're in, you're in you don't i mean yeah, yeah. Actually, i tell you tell you what one of the most fun things about peanut was this series because i typically view peanut as like a 
pretty conservative pathing jungler, but like he he takes the high percentage scenario, but he's very good at finding the the high percentages and making them work in his favor. Um, the fact that in this series he was like using phase rush and nimbus cloak to like randomly get out of scenarios was just really really funny to me. Um, because I think historically, I mean. Historically, Pina and Ona have played a very similar style because for those years which don't know this from who didn't watch Pina back in the day, Pina invented the Battle Ward style jungler. It was a, it was a term which was coined by Papa Smithy um, back in season... Well, he would have joined back in season 6 back then, I think. Wait, Papa joined in season 6, right? I don't think he was there in season 5. Um, yeah, Pina, when he particularly went on to rocks, but he did this around Najin as well, was the player that would get vision by not placing wards in the jungle the way that Samsung White would, but he would actually just use his own face on a champion which can just harass you. Not always to kill you, he'd walk into your jungle just to see where you are. Now, Ona has typically been doing that for T1 when they've been at their best as well. So Ona and Pina have a very similar style, but I think that right now, because... Um, I think, you know, obviously you've got players like, like Pino who just like really step up, particularly against T1. He's just sort of, he's just got, he's in their heads really, really well. It means that you have a like for like style and it means the owner is typically found out when he's going on to certain camps. And I think Pino, of his skill set, he is really good at assessing where vision is and finding his way through it. And that does mean that like, he's not going to take a lot of the risky play. He, well, weirdly he did in this series, but most of the time he doesn't do a lot of the risky plays. He's very good at weaving his way around vision though. And using like his timings really well just to make high percentage plays. And like when you're ganking a mini nar, diving a night mini nar is a high percentage play. And Zayas just like didn't realize what danger he was in. Because like if, if a guy was coming out of fog of war, you had to know he was there to then avoid that play. I think that because but, um sorry. owner and carrier were so slow on their map movements, like most of the time, it meant that Peanut had so many high percentage plays available to him that like it was really hard for him to not get value knowing the player that Peanut is. Peanut is. Right, so uh, let, like here's why I'm like less critical of like in the context of like owner and not so much more critical in in terms of the bot lane, but it's not solely binary. Owner's options are right. Okay, he has Zeri Lulu bot lane that he must cover. If that lane like goes like behind and it ends up being like on a freeze out, because Ezreal and Alistair, if they if they do get if they if pop Poppy goes bottom and the ganks like work. Ezreal Alistair with the poppy can end up causing like a freeze out on early early on onto the Zeri like Lulu if they end up like, killing like one person and pushing them off the tower because they can just threaten to like dive right okay so he he like this, I'm just like saying like if you disagree like, that's fair enough yeah, right? I don't agree about the lane matchup we go on yeah <laughs> no 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 not in terms of like the 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 lane matchup in terms of like if poppy goes like bottom and he like Sejuani like goes to like cover so o owner opts to cover his Zeri and Lulu the most of the game right. And Poppy chooses to just regank over and over again, like Zeus, into like the Rumble, okay? But say like uh, owner was to like ignore the bot lane and just leave it as is and go cover his like top lane, it would still be losing. As in like Sej, um, Sejuani uh, Nar loses to Poppy like Rumble. Like, oh yeah, like, why they allowed the rumble to go through is like exactly. So like, well. what what yeah. is owner's actual option? If, do you, if owner has to go bottom, right? And see, he sees Poppy go like going top all the time, and he is right. It is so much harder for Sejuani to find acceleration plays and acceleration ganks into Ezreal and Alistar because most likely than not, to kill one or two, you need level six. Whilst Poppy does not need level six to kill. Uh, um, Zeus, particularly if Zeus takes, has been really aggressively health traded on, and so I I don't know like what the like, owner's like options are like other than like he could have possibly like played more for like mid lane and tried to like get Faker um out of mid lane and move like move Faker like for like mid turret prio and get him to like move to like side. I mean I think that, is the, I think that is the answer. Yeah, but though. he's, like, he's think... on Tristana, so is what Tristana just to sit in a lane. With his and sorry, with a Lulu and a a Zeri like banging a turret and then hoping to God that like you make it back to like midwave before the double wave crash like that just doesn't seem that viable to me. I think it's all right. I think if I I think the big problem in with the Nar game with the Nar into Rumble was that because Zeus did not this even though he's gonna lose, but, but because Zeus does not play that situation out well. Like, mm -hmm. we're now looking at it through that prism rather yes. than, like, if Ona had just sacked top and had played around mid into bot, I think it could have been fine. Like, I also think that in the bot lane matchup specifically, even though obviously, like, Alistair Ez has, like, good disengage, that actually that is a really heavily T1 sided lane. And getting plates can be better than a successful dive, right? Or if a dive leaves into plates. So, I don't know. I, I think it's a bit more. 
balance than just like oh the trade off going bot and while they while actually go top is a bad one. I don't think it necessarily is bad. I think accelerating bot through plates even more, if they do dodge yeah. the bot. So the my my, my, my issue with that is then like so I think really no, I'm saying what, it, I think Owen have done it properly. I think he assessed it properly. I think well, like that and, and the point is that like I think he actually assessed the game like correctly. I don't think he played bad this well, series. I, I don't think he assessed his own jungle support's power very effectively because I think that when they went bot and they didn't manage to unlock uh well the problem is you'd like you're roaming with a Lulu as well. Like realistically if you are on if you were going to get ganked by, you know, like, the Rumble Poppy, like, as an R, like, you were so screwed, you need probably two people in your lane. The fact that the team did not assess that top lane needed that and he died on cooldown is a, is, is a bigger problem for me. Now, I think that uh, you mentioned, like, the weaknesses of T1 kind of, like, not really being assessed over time. I think when they're playing at their best, their weaknesses aren't really relevant, which is why they've not done that, because a lot of the time they have counter pick top lane for Zayas when he's like or like a, just a matchup where he's just like brutalizing lane so he never really gets to that point so, and he can 1v2 at points where like you know he was he was very happy blind picking the lethality aatrox but like when he had the yone matter and stuff like that he was really really good at taking 1v2s at that point um i i have no idea why they let the rumble through like that that rumble was R rumble is the most unfair champion in the game right now Lord. Oh, it's, no, it's no, insane. No, nothing deals with rumble even we well, look we tried to lane swap rumble out of the meta it didn't work he's still too good we tried to like lock some like random counter picks into it. it just doesn't work carries don't work against him tanks don't work against him bruises don't work against him just don't let rumble don't let don't <laughs> let rumble through like this champion is so freaking busted right now like I think, like, there are some other trends in terms of blind pickable top laners. We've seen some top laners make the Renekton work. I don't really think of Zayas as a, like, a huge... Like, I know that he played... They, they won the one Renekton game that they had. But even then, I don't count, like, Zayas as, like, a huge Renekton player in that regards. But, like, the Rumble, I just feel like no one should get to play this right now. Like, I guess the the only thing I would be giving up Rumble for is maybe... Ash Braum's a really good duo, but even then, that's shit into Rumble because Ash is, like, awful against the Equalizer. Just... just don't let that through for starters, but if you are going to, at least have a solid plan to stop Rumble from, like, getting 2v1, like, assistance. Like, that's just not okay. Why, why did we think this was going to work? Most teams of the world would make, like, Rumble into a good matchup with a ganking jungler. Like, that would cause problems for any team by any team, basically. Yeah. <laughs> like, come on. <laughs> Right, so obviously we know what happened in this series. Uh, what, of course, is pretty interesting is that these guys are immediately rematching this week. So, yes, T1 will play HLE again. So my question for you, Kira, is uh, what should the adaptation be from T1? What, how do T1 reverse this result in the rematch? Don't I let Rumble through, like if I f for like game one. I know it sounds stupid, but it's like why play the why even bother like playing with fire. Uh, I actually just don't like that owner on Sejuani. It's a bit like Razor on Sejuani. I think it's like, well, I think owner's better on Sejuani than Razor kids. But as in like, I think right now owner's probably one of the best like um players on the team. I think that you could have them on to a variety uh, unless it's a full AP like jungler like pinch. I think T1's lanes are actually good enough. I think, obviously, like, Zeus fucked his lane up, but, like, I think T1's lanes are good enough to facilitate owner being onto, like, the AP, like, jungler, like, style and allowing him to, like, farm up. Uh, like, basically, turning owner into somewhat, like, a uh, canyon-esque, but, like, maybe picking more, like, ag like aggressive, like, variants. Because, at the end of the day, T1 likes to, like, skirmish and play around, like, objectives, and if owner can bring large APs, APs, um, AoE burst to these objectives. It's also really good. Like, uh, T1 loves a fast Baron. You know, Brand, Zyra, um, even Nidalee will supply more damage to a fast Baron than a Sejuani ever will, particularly in the context of also having double ADCs as a potential thing that, like, they're um, opting into. So, as such, um, I think that, like, would be an adaptation I like to see. Um, I know why I've got a feeling they like, um, it's a bit like the Mako, uh, JJ, like, thing, where they have owner on primary engage because he's the person who's most comfortable on it, because, uh, uh, Korea's really struggled on primary engage recently, um, and so, like, to, like, help out Korea, you put owner onto primary engage and the game becomes, like, easier to play, but... 
I don't think you always build a team of T ones quality. It always needs to have like dedicated like primary engage like all the time. I think they can like play like a, a it's harder because you can't like reach out and grab out of position people just as easy. But I do think they are. Um, they're trying too much, do you know what I mean, to like have those like big engage tools, but I don't think they like need them. I think they're overvaluing large engage tools, particularly on someone who I think should be on a higher damage carry threat. And I think that's what their adaptation should totally be. Totally agree with that. I think boiling it down to the core of it, I want more burst, less frontline. For yes, them. I think they just, just go like like this. This is like that that they need more burst because this yes. team is so burst oriented. The way they think about the game is how do I get this explosive first bit? Because they are very good at coordinating. Very good at like mechanically playing out the burst champions as well. I think that comboed up with an oppressive bot lane, which then unlocks carrier to roam and equalize out the map and helps Zayas if he's got pressure on his lane really, really helps. I think that, you know, keep keep the fake it blind picking his pushing mids. That's fine. That has been something which has like been a hallmark of your style. As long as he has a safe pushing mid lane, like fake is completely fine there. I think like it's okay for owner to be on the soul engaged slash flat and champion. I actually don't mind the Sejuani in regards to that. As long as the rest of the team has adequate enough burst to follow up with it. I don't particularly love the Nar coming in from Zaius right now. Um, if they're picking it into that kind of style. Like I don't mind Nar into the Cassante, but even then, you know. Like, like, like Nar into Rumble. It's just and way too Nar, yeah, like yeah. just 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 don't, I mean, I don't like any seeds to rebel right now, but now particularly, it's like, you're going to lose wave control, you're going to get ganked, it's going to be pretty awful. So I think that largely more burst, less tank, I think is probably what you need. Play faster, play um, team fights. Um, I, I, yeah, I think that's largely through it. And I think particularly when T1 have an oppressive winning bot lane, they are so good at warping the map through just like going into the enemy jungle and then unlocking carrier and owner to roam about that it is not a fair game. Um, so in regards to that, I think probably... Stuff like I don't get why Goomer is prioritizing this Zeri so much. Like I get that is better for the longer team fights and it's a safe laning phase. I don't want safe laning phase scaling up into longer team fights in the late game. That's not what I want from these. I want bursty oppressive lanes, which add, like they they add into that. I mean, I don't mind. I where like where's the stuff like you know they've got two games of of Ash each, and I guess the the Ash is banned against them an awful lot. But I'm basically sat here looking at um. Looking at stuff which can be impressive in lane and then just unlock this support to even out the map because I think that this team like desperately needs carry and owner back in form and unlock from the map. And I think a lot of that starts with an impressive winning bot lane to then even out things. So the question is, guys, what are you predicting to happen in the rematch? Kira, how do you see this one going? Does T1 get the revenge or is it uh yeah, I think T1 will repeat? win the I think T1 will win the rematch. But like, I think it's like pretty close. Um I don't think like Put it this way, it's gonna sound like weird. I don't think uh T one will be putting as much stock into the these games right now um as like a lot of other teams into like the summer season. Um like the T one summer lull is like a pretty co common occurrence, even as like a franchise going all the way like back in the day. I know they are all like people like Faker are like chasing and trying to go for everything, but they do um, there's many, many times T1 as like an organization and as like a gr group of variety of the gr variety different groups of players have always just lulled into the into the summer. I will why. say as well, and people like Nada okay. this is one, but it does happen. Well, so I I think so. This is this is just like a larger topic. The best team in the world who typically has the best start from off season and keeps that momentum running through spring and wins MSI is typically Nerf. Because the dominant style and pro play is typically spearheaded by the best team and the team which wins the most in spring. Now, typically what that means is that you don't find... This is why the Golden Road is so hard. The team that is attempting the Golden Road very typically gets a good start off of offseason. They've had really good prep. They get a roster which clicks immediately, something like that. And it gives them a head start onto the meta. You win spring, you win MSI. And then because it is the dominant style in the meta and you have shown what you can play the best and what is the best currently at the peak level of play, which is what typically the the top teams do, it's not always true, um, that gets nerfed out of the game. That gets nerfed to a point where you can't play as heavily into your style. And I think this is kind of, it's kind of fucked up in a way, because there are probably other versions of, of styles of play which could perform to that level. It's just the particular... Yeah. That the team which is winning the most has just found their own like local maximum and there are multiple local maximum which can compete with each other in regards to, like you could be playing a different style of champion i mean for instance like if t1 didn't just randomly switch their champion pools and like figure out how they wanted to play in worlds last year we would have been considering different champions op at that tournament rather than thinking about the double 80 carries being op sometimes it takes one team to do that and like particularly when it came into the summer splits when you know, like SKT, I think it was in season six, right? They didn't end up winning summer, but they won season five summer into 
well, they won like everything except MSI in season five, and then they come through into season six, and like they win Spring and MSI. At that point, there have been so many successive nerfs to the style of play which they were really good at that they ended up finally losing it. And then, of course, that all came to the pinnacle at um, season seven, where it got to where I was like, "Oh, fucking hell! You 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 can't play the style of play which you would like to." Um, and this has happened to multiple teams. This has happened to teams over time, where like the best team in the world directly gets nerfed, which. Ironically, probably means that Faker, because he's been so good at the start of the year in so many seasons, is probably the person who is most individually responsible for, like, changing the game off of his own level of play, which is kind of like a fun factoid there. He has directly changed the game because he was the best at certain styles, and that is just, like, in the bedwork of the game right now. So who are you picking, Nymera? Um, T1, I think that T1, T1 staff, I think this is really apparent at MSI. If you look at MSI, the G2, the two G2 series that T1 played um, at MSI, First series, T1 made things really close with awesome prep in terms of the draft and their level ones. T1 faced them the second time, it is not close at all because they have much better prep. I yeah, think that true. you can you can catch T1 sleeping for one series. I think this is why double elimination tournaments are really dangerous to T1. If you face T1 a second time, I'm always favoring T1. I think they're fantastic. And it might not be the answer which I reached, which is probably, you know, worth it because I think I'm intelligent about the game, but am I T1's coaching staff, like, with some of the highest resources in the world? Probably not, backed by some of the best players in the world. I think that when they go into a rematch, T1 are infinitely dangerous. So I, I would imagine they come out, God, even maybe 2-0. It depends how good their preppers. Yeah, I think I'm going 2-1. I think I like T1 here also, but I'll, I'll say 2-1. Anyway, enough about the boys in red. Let's talk about Kwangdong. Uh, for anyone who didn't see, they had one of the most uh, extraordinary, in a way, series of all time. Let me just set the scene for people who missed it. Um, so game one against DRX, they had a 4k gold lead, a 3-0 to zero Drake lead, and zero kills at 26 minutes. And then ended the game a minute later off a team fight at Red Buff and just killed the nexus and Please then tell me monty vod reviewed this because that's I, like I the zero so. kill league of legends is like the classic monty style yeah if you if you go if you go into a vod review about knowing what happened in that one that would be uh pretty <laughs> top kick yeah. uh, so yeah and then in game two even better they had no kills at 30 minutes and then just turn the game at a uh, drake fight although actually i think then they lost baron but then whatever mm. anyway they ended the game eight minutes after that having had no kills at 30 minutes so yeah this was what we call a slow burner i think it's fair to say um they also played gen g and actually had some close fights i mean i do find that whenever i'm talking about teams against gen g i'm looking for like the most furthest yeah. reaching points i can come up with um i mean cuz had a good Viego. I think his story, this split, has been one of the most interesting ones. Bulldog showed Zeri mid. That is the first Zeri mid in LCK Summer. So that's a fun factoid to come out of the Gen G series. Actually, honestly, the Zeri mid didn't look that bad. Like, I could see a scenario it's, where it's against... been really cropping up in LPL. It's like, yeah. again, it's basically just saying, I want an AD mid, but the tier list is like Corky Tristana. Well, yeah. even then, the Corky's actually fallen off because Lucian is good into Corky, so Lucian's hanging about there now. If you have a good Yone player, it's there. Jace is niche because you need a certain team comp, and he doesn't win that many lanes. And then you have Zeri, which is kind of like similar level to Lucian, maybe just below, because he doesn't have the hard winning lane matchups. But if you run Barrier on Zeri mid and you take a good level one trade, like, this champion is actually pretty solid. By the way, yeah. you read the name of... Sorry, I'll go you, Rich. No, yeah. no, no, okay, go on. Right, it, this is one of the league paradoxes. And I, I know if you apply a little bit to your head, it does actually... It becomes less of a paradox, but it's like, okay, in bot lane, right? Vayne, why do we not pick her? Well, she loses every lane. But if I pick her top lane, she wins every lane because she's a range champion and the melee champions. Mid lane, okay, Jace. If I play him top lane, why does he win every lane? Okay, because he's got two sets of abilities and when he all in you, he destroys you. But if I pick him mid into ADCs, he loses every lane. Okay, <laughs> okay, so, where, Let, well, wait, so ADCs, prefer... okay, why do ADCs have support players? Okay, because they're really weak early. So that's why we give them a support player. <laughs> okay, what are we going to do with ADCs? Okay, we're going to play ADCs in every single solo lane and maybe even jungle. <laughs> Why is League of Legends peak, like that? Peak League of Legends. Yeah. 
<laughs> what yeah, we, how have we ended up at this point in League of Legends? What Marksman complained that their role was so weak for so long. Now everyone has to play Marksman. They have now made because basic. This is just a giant psyop to get everyone to play Marksman. Enjoy that dopamine of ruining a lane for five minutes because no one can play against you at level one, level two, level three. And then, like, you then want the AD carries to be good because you have learned the joy of r less ruining lanes on ADC. So you, they, you don't want them to get nerfed anymore. The other roles have been indoctrinated into the cult of ADCs. I always feel like the meta's not quite in the spot you want it to be in when Quinn is, like, viable whatsoever because that champion was just created to be super irritating. Like, Funnily enough, I reached my highest rank ever playing Quinn as well. <laughs> there you go. Another reason to ha mean, harass Nymera. People. Yeah. W one more point to the point of, like... Interest. Do you think we'd be in an AC, a ADC um, meta if we just removed Kraken? If you took Kraken out, do you think they would just build a different item and it would just be as important? Or the fact that one item Kraken is such a potent spike? I think, like, it, would that... still, I think it would still be viable. I think it would still be viable. I mean, it... instead, like, just I mean Kraken, a... Kraken in solo lane is... is... Pretty big. I mean, Shiv has still got good stats. So you can still build Shiv. Okay, it would look. It would be worse. I think we'd see less of it in solo lanes, but you'd still see enough of it. Oh, so like, fair enough. Yeah. Um. I think that you know, I, um, there are enough AD carries that can build either Shiv or. I mean, in some cases, you can even go towards like Infetch first if you do get a really good first pack for BF Sword. But like that, that's a different story altogether. I think like you would probably see a lot of it fall off. Of course, like when it's in jungle, very, very different. Also, there's a couple of AD carriers which can just go Triforce as well, and it's completely fine for them. Yeah, it, because, looks because Kraken isn't a crit item anymore. Weirdly, Kraken is sometimes less mandatory because it's not, because there are so few good first items which are crit. Um, you can kind of go towards a lot of stuff and you don't feel as bad because you're not missing out on crit because a lot of the crit items for first are not awesome so it's like thereabouts i think tristana would still be like tier one and just picked every other fucking game um yeah anyway uh yeah so Quangdong, who had a very interesting week they also play hle now me and nymera were talking a little bit about this before the show which is Quangdong do seem to be this team where you get excited for them because you know they were pretty bad or pretty whatever last split um, lots of players having nice glow ups. They clearly upgraded ADC. I think Leaper is really good, but it is, it does feel to me like they're this kind of bait team where you see lots of nice, cool little storylines and stuff. And where you, you forget really, all the weaknesses. Yeah. And you really want to believe yeah. in them because, like, Cuz is they, a good they do, jungler. They do nothing. Like, Bulldog <laughs> is did Bulldog is having a really good split for him. Leaper mm -hmm. is an upgrade on Bull, but how good really is Leaper? Like, he is good, but you know. Are they actually ever going to be this? Even top lane, like he's playing, you know, there there are sort of, I don't know. You know what they are? They're the classroom. They're the elementary school classroom gold star team. You just constantly want to say, pat them on the head and say, good job, boys, and give them a nice gold star. But do you really believe that they're going to be an elite team? I would love this team to like make worlds or something ahead of like, I don't know, KT, who are an unserious League of Legends team to me, for example. Yeah. But will it happen? Uh, probably not. But yeah, so they play, they also play HLE, which I think is actually a really huge litmus test. I don't think they necessarily need to win the series, but I feel like this is a good, like, gatekeeper series, potentially, especially with KT come on the come up now, so they're back in the picture. Like, it's not a given that HLE are definitely going to go to Worlds. Quang Dong are, like, massive outsiders, but they could, in theory, I guess. But they would have to win series like this to make you believe that they could make it to Worlds, right? So that's why I think this is actually a very interesting series. But yeah, Nymera, what do you think about this Quang Dong matchup? Do you see any potential winning angles? As Kira said, we like to talk about the strengths, but this team does also have a uh, boatload yeah. of weaknesses. Yeah, they are weirdly flexible and rigid because I think that Cuz is one of the most flexible junglers in the league right now, and that does open up some some difficult different win conditions to the point where, like, you can see, like, a Morgana jungle, like, winning a game through draft. I do think that, like, uh, Bulldog is very rigid and it's very clear what he's good at. You want to get him, like, a, like a good mobile ADC mid. I am surprised like it wouldn't be surprising to me if bulldog ended up pulling out lucian in this series because it feels like a lot of other people are starting to pull out that lucian a bit a bit more and like i wasn't that impressed with it when i first started seeing it from like knight and chovy which was like you know even even chovy didn't look that great on it but the last week or so we started seeing some particularly in lpl some of these um lucian mids start to really dominate again and it means that you can punish corky blind picks because you end up like very early on at level one you can start either with q and poke through the wave or e and dodge out the fast bomb for heavier trades 
Um, I like level two. Typically, Corky starts with the Gatling bomb, but uh, Gat Gatling gun. But still, once he has the Frost bomb, if you can dash over it, like Lucian hard wins any trade there, and it means that you can control the Corky matchup, which is not something which many champions do. Tristana pushes in but doesn't have kill threat. Lucian pushes him and has kill threat, which means he's like a in somehow. I mean, you probably still trade take the Tristana because he's better because she's better across the entire game, but. Um, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if Bulldog goes towards that at some point, but you still realistically want him on, like, um, Tristana, Corky, Lucian, maybe the Zeri if that can continue through as well. I don't think it's, like, completely fair to view that Zeri lost, because it's like, you know, whatever, it's against Genji, who cares about that, right? Like, yeah, And he wasn't bad, like, individually no, he, wasn't. he wasn't bad. Yeah, so I think, like, you know what you want out of him. Realistically, what I think Kwangdong would need to do is, like, open up enough flexibility for Cuz to have a game-winning pick from jungle. That's yeah, quite hard to do. That... That, that's just, like yeah. that's my big one he was up against sponge and mm. he was like feasting famining like sponge like sponge just didn't have a clue what to do like sp yeah this is one of the things in a competitive sense sponge did not know like he knew what to do against the high farming ap jungler just taking all his camps all the time and him not being able to use his laners to protect his camps like and then because realized this and just gobbled his jungle it just didn't stop eating it Sorry, no, I mean, I was just yeah, no, 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 no. And that's like, I think Cuz, Cuz is like the draft, the draft silver bullet potential. Like, and that's, that's okay, because I think Peanut largely knows what he wants to be blind picking. He wants to be something that is like, fairly safe. He probably doesn't want to be on the AP farmers. You want him on like Sajwani Poppy, so he can like trade off frontline duty with everyone else. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of this is on, you know, mobile, mobile reposition AD carry for Leaper. So that's Ezreal, Zeri, um, Kaiser, because... Um, I think this is also the case with HLE slightly as well, and you can see this across multiple teams, even good teams, this can be the case, but like, you can see that there are two parts, there are two lines to every team front, which, which, which makes sense, right? You have the front line, you have the back line, but then the spacing between them needs to be really, really precise, particularly as an AD carry, you need to plan like your steps for what's happening in about two, three seconds, because if you're not immediately there when the play happens, you're not in auto attack range. But also, if you overstep that, then you're caught when the engage comes in when you actually should have taken a back step a second or two ago. Um, having stuff like Corky Tristana, Zeri, Kaisa, Ezreal, and and in some ways also the long range utility AD carries like sometimes Ash because she has approach velocity and she can lead with with W and ult as well. Sometimes the Jin because you can lead W ult as well. Similar kind of abilities um, means that you're even though your backline might be out of position at the start of a fight, they can very quickly get into position because these champions allow them that. So realistically, you're wanting Bulldog and Leaper to make their job as easy as possible because I don't think they are as good as positioning. Um, compared to Zeka, who also does similar things on Yone as well, which is, again, a very quick repositioning champion that can impact fights very, very quickly. And, of course, someone like Viper, who is just... I don't think he's, you know, on... I don't think he's on, like, world-beating form, but it's still Viper, you know? Um, so, realistically, you want that. You, you need those, which is largely what they've been drafting towards anyway. There's no change there, really. Um, but realistically, what you're wanting to be doing is opening up Cuz to have, like, I don't know, like, Morgana into Vi or something, or even Morgana into Poppy or whatever. I think that, like, that, that might throw HLE for a loop because... Their, their typical high percentage r rinse and repeat plays in terms of like Poppy Wall Stun, Poppy going blah blah blah. Doesn't really work when P Morgana like kind of like cucks one of your main engage points. So I think that for me it kind of has to come through because from, um, from draft. It's going to be quite hard to replicate that. I think it's really hard to open up spots like that. Because let's be honest, if you're leaving jungles like fourth, fourth, fifth at some points, it's quite hard to find those angles, particularly in game two or three of a series is the problem I would run into. Because it's like, what happens if, um, you know, you leave open jungle for four or five um, for Cuz in a big draft, you're on red side, um, and you pick something like a Morgana in a good spot, or you pick like a Viego in a good spot, or a Nidalee in a good spot. Well, Nidalee is probably going to be like in, in the first couple of picks anyway, because it's, it, it, it's just the way it is right now. Um, but what happens if you then try and run that same draft in game two or game three, and you ban it in like between the two rounds of bans? Like, what happens then? Like, do you have a second champion for that? I think that might be a bit of a stretch. I also want to see Andy on engage. Like, that guy's eye for engage is really, really good. And if you want to like, Beat teams that are better than you, snap and gauge and catch a multi man. AoE, CC chains, it's a very, very good way to do it. You can also pair up with like Cuz's pool very effectively, get acceleration, invasions going. Problem is, I just look at the backline, I just don't think their backline's as good as HLE. Like, if you take a long drawn out long game Welcome against HLE, double... that's exactly what they want. Like, the, the, the pecking order. Like, uh, Kwang Dong plays slow and they lose to HLE. HLE plays late, plays slow and they lose to Genji. 
kind of one of the issues that you have. So, is it fair to say that you're both heavily favouring HLE in this series then? Yeah, I mean, there's a path to victory. It's just quite hard to open. So HLE, I think they're very they're, they're more stable now. I think that their early split showed a couple of wobbles. I think that you know Peanuts on good form. I think they figured out what they want to do in regards to like you know um, their front. They've really nailed down their identity. Like, yeah, really, I think that I, uh... I, I will say I'm not a huge fan of HLE playing towards carries and topside. Like the, the Quinn. Like, as a Quinn connoisseur, this is one of my most played champions, wasn't hugely, um, like, um, I wasn't hugely impressed with, like, how he was getting himself into positions to blow summoners very cheaply on Quinn. Like, as Quinn, each, it doesn't matter what summons you take, whether it's Cleanse or Ignite or whatever, it depends on the lane matchup, like, you cannot blow that for free. It needs to be for a kill trade most of the time. And the fact that he was, like, blowing both summoners on defensive weak side, like, that is a failure of him and a failure of the team. He is much better for me on the big tanks, where, like, again, I think having the triple frontline trading off HP tanking duty to, like, bat on past the frontline in the in, in a team fight is really, really good. Like, that's what I want to see from them. And I think they've if they nail down that bit, so it's not just the double front line, it's the triple, I think that makes them even stronger. And yeah, I think that, that that's been really good for them. Yeah, as I said, I'm, I'm leaning 2-0 actually here. I I think it would be awesome for the league if Quang Dong, in a kind of a similar that way that we've talked about how um, it would be good for LEC, for example, if after making a couple of roster moves, SK suddenly becomes like a super legit team. I would say that one's still slightly pending maybe but i think if kwang dong were to like actually break through against a big team and be seen as like a playoff threat that would be awesome for lck it's not like we're lacking good teams in lck but it's always fun when you get another contender the thing I, is, I just don't i just don't see it unfortunately i, I just think the thing is, is that, that then also tells you the feeling of hle and hle is the type of team i want to see pushing t1 and gen g like, yeah, you know but in I mean? my like, delusional world, Kira, it's not because HLE aren't awesome. It's just because Quang Dog really are that legit. You know, Leaper, it, dog, Leaper dog, is just dog, YouTuber dog. turned Uzi Eye, you know? Like, that, that is the narrative I want to happen. So, yeah. And also, a team that's, as far as I'm aware, named after a brand of noodles being really good. I mean, who doesn't want that? That's just peak, isn't it? So, uh, yeah. Anyway, let's move on to a team who were in complete shambles and probably, let's be real, still kind of are in shambles. But as we said um, last week, KT probably would end up picking up a few more wins off the back of that uh, T1 win, first and foremost, because they had a pretty easy schedule. So they, yeah. got, they got to play Nongshim and Fear X, um, beat them pretty Pop handily. Seals. Yeah, uh, they some seals. And they have a good chance this week of picking up a couple more wins because they get to play Fear X again. Uh, and then DRX, who don't look great, let's be honest. Um, so, yeah, I'm not going to spend too much time speaking about KT, but I did, as they are, you know, going to be seen as surging for the super casuals who might not even watch the games, but just see their scoreline going up. Do we think anything's actually changed here? Do they actually look, you know, more legit? Do they look less shaky? Or is this just a... A scoreline facade the, the, nightmare. What the do you draft think? Them somehow wash. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's super weird because, like, for me, like the big litmus test is what the hell. It's like if if Pioshik has a good angle and draft, I think this team typically does better because, like, Pioshik is the person that suffers the most when, like, I think Pioshik and Beryl, they're they're the players that suffer the most when the draft falls with it. So, like, I don't mind them going more towards like the Ivan. I think the Ivan, the Vi, like. One of the things which we saw against T1, which I really, really liked, is that, like, when their comp has, like, a has a great identity, when, so, for instance, against T1, the big one which I remember was the, like, the Vi Leona with, like, a reset comp for Jinx with a whole load of follow-up from Talia Rumble. That was cool. Like, that's, like, awesome. You know exactly what that team does, not it? You just have to read it on the tin. That's, like, really important to it. Um, and, like, I don't, I don't mind what they've been doing since then with, like, picking, you know, double tank frontline, uh, with either, like, the Tarek or the Ivan, they had, they had, a, like, a couple of games with that, where it's, like, you have double ADC or double long-range carries, and you're playing towards, like, some form of pseudo-enchanter plus the, plus the frontline, it makes it easier to figure things out, but, like, I feel like this team needs to be going more towards those combos again still, because, like, the more vague you make the team comps, the more these players are likely to wander off in different directions. They need to like be really front and center, show exactly what this team comp does. Otherwise, I, I start to lose quite a lot of faith in them. But hey, it, then you're just left with this question of, well, are they going to draft like something which the players understand? And you're left really confused. Yeah, Kira, are you uh, not, not, not a believer yet? Me, like... I hate the, the, the top... Top, the idea of the top side of this team 
to begin with. And I'm feeling pretty vindicated. Like, this is an unfortunate circumstances of, like, BDD and death are just kind of wasting their time. Because, like, the consistency of execution that's, like, asked on them, the love it probably is way too high. Beryl's just, his level's, like, all over the place. I don't think it's so much tied to draft, because, like, Beryl kind of shows, well, there is an aspect of it that is tied to draft, but, like, Beryl is just one of those, like, very high, like, variance players already, and if you look at, like, Boshek as well, remember, we had, um, Boshek was pretty fucking terrible, and then he had, like, that random pop-off game at, like, Worlds, where he was, like, insane, you know, he had pop-off games winning Worlds, by the way, hang on, hang on. Tangent here. I need a tangent here. You know the game versus T1, the one we were talking about where he's on TL there? Like, that game has been used as a banner for NA for so much, and, and, and it's good for them. It is complete bullshit. If you look at the way T1 play out that game in Swiss stage, when, like, he's on the lease and he's doing crazy kicks and blah, blah, blah. T1 basically balanced equation. They said, we're going to play on three lanes, especially after the lane swap, and we're going to get more XP and gold, and that will be more than the kills they get when they're picking us off isolated inside. And eventually what happened is they came to the first 5v5 of the game, T1 had more resources and they won the game. That's yeah. all that matters in the game. The fact that there were random kills going across doesn't actually matter because T1 had already ran the numbers and said, okay, sure, we'll give up, we'll probably give up a flash on two kills here or whatever. We'll be behind in kills. It won't fucking matter because they're playing on two lanes or one lane, we're playing on three and we're getting more experience and more gold. The the fact that people don't realize this and they keep saying like oh but t1 they ran over the early game it really annoys me this is one of the problems when like people are speaking out on situations that they genuinely don't understand because t1 they were never sweating in that game the first and only 5v5 which mattered in that game like t1 completely dumpstered it because they had so much more gold and xp like that game big it, it really frustrates me because basically t1 had an economic style victory from civilization because like they just played the the map in terms of farming way way better and, like people just don't call the, this out they just look the, at the I funny mean, plays that, is, that was the virgin lck analysis cope and i'm going to just say <laughs> ha 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 chad Foshek, Lee Sing Kick. <laughs> the, the, the mechanics were good, but it didn't matter. It's, it, it literally doesn't matter. The mechanics do not matter because the equation has already been solved by T1, where they're farming three lanes when you're farming like one and a half. It just because, doesn't because matter. Then he's, like, he's like limitless. He's like, I've already seen the line, you know. It's like Korea's like dying inside and he's like reaching, reaching across. He nudges the mouse so that like Gumum gets the idea. Oh, why do I want to go to bottle in there? Oh, and like, and, and to, to be clear, I know that people were specifically players in the mechanics and that was really Really, really cool but like i've seen so many brain dead tweets at like tweets from like nobody's on twitter but like blood t1 almost beat them then blah 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 that game at worlds was not close i will say the games at ewc were i think that tol were like the better team for like 80 percent okay, of those Fosh games wasn't on those, those yeah, games yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So okay. yeah, yeah. No, no, and, yeah I, know, I know that one but like no but when it comes to like the tl fans and whatever but like when it comes to, like they were genuinely eight like for 80 percent of those games they were better it's just in the clutch t1 you were better couldn't games, let but, like, them have one could you nightmare you no, couldn't I even let them one. have one and for this year for the EWC stuff because they were largely the better team but like last and worlds like th like th th these games are going to be like taken out of proportion and people won't remember them because we're too far removed from them because we're almost a year away from when that happened but so, like genuinely go back and watch that go look how many lanes like T1 are farming they are getting so many more resources and it's like yeah you give up two or three kills and like they get mechanically outplayed at, at one point but the mecha even a worst case scenario T1 are still probably breaking even and it's completely fine so let me take right. this massively, <laughs> massively out of proportion. And, but, mate, the thing is, is like, I, I, just, I despise him as a player. I think he's terrible. I Bullshit, absolutely yeah. hate... Yeah, I hate, like, full, full shit, like, in the server in Minecraft. Um, but, like, the the fact is, like, I just don't get the point of, like, why be, like, a team... I know you lost Keen, right? And then you're going to replace him with, like, a rookie. But when you look at, like, the, the style that, like, of players who they went away and they got, and then you... You went and you were like, okay, we're gonna pair that with Foshek. It's like it makes absolutely like no sense. We're like KT should be the other team like HLA, like Genji, who are wanting slow roll team fights, very controlled, very set up. Like you know what I mean. And then meanwhile they have a jungler who's famous for like opting into the, the craziest like laning, um, they call it skirmishing. Sorry, not laning, but like um early jungle like flips, like flipping game on early game jungles jungle constantly like uh, vying for a specific side lane and just co like going there all the time and opting straight uh, into skirmish plays that like he's basically just trying to like flip and win from like accelerating lanes right and it's just not well suited and i don't think it's ever going to be well suited i, I think 
KT, I've got like a, a decent floor on them across the bread. Obviously, we've seen how floor, low that floor can be. But in terms of the individual players, but as a team, it's like I don't, I, I, I don't know what the what the, the point is. It's like yeah, they could be like pretty like good, but that, like they would also have to like flip into like you know flip into that. They're they're just like such like a a strange team because like the identity of the players is like such like a big like mismatch for me. Yeah. Um, I'd be a bit worried if I was a KT fan at the moment in terms of like projecting towards Worlds because especially with the sort of emergence of D+, who we'll talk about in a bit, is looking like pretty legit. I mean, you know, there's only so many teams that can go to Worlds and they do not look like a top four team now with, you know, T1, Gen G and obviously actually also in the mix. You need like a normal draft. Like, so first thing, you, your coaches have to give you a normal draft. Right? That's not always a given, okay? Second of all, you need your like high variance players just that by the way this is just for you to be decent you need your high variance players to like be good so like you need Beryl and Foshek and um your rookie top to like be like decent third you need BBD if you actually want to be good teams to be on like a select like number of of like packs of like of like comfort right and then at, once you've got all of those okay down you then and only once you've got those down right that does actual in-game stuff start like setting up objectives, like assigning goal values, which side of the lane do you think you should play for? Sign laning, map setups, um, vision like control. Fo people like Foshek are infamously terrible at like controlling like vision. It's like one of the worst aspects of having him on your team is that he's like as a jungler terrible at doing like vision control. So I have no like upwards hope for like KT. I think they're just going to be as good as like the players like are and they're, they're basically just the sum of the parts and or less yeah i think that's a good way of uh it is one of my least it. favorite things by the way in pro league of legends but like there are obviously talented players who are detracting from each other like as someone who wants to see the best possible league of legends seeing teams which is like actively undermining each other because the players are just like not on the same page or coaching staff doesn't know how to get the best players like that just frustrates me as a fan of league of legends like i mean we've seen it with plenty of things over the time it reminds me of Remember that old kind of... I feel like the first su super team, because the old definition of that in League of Legends was a super team that could play through... would carry in every single lane. That never worked up until about Season 8 when we had IG doing that, realistically. And then you could say, like, weirdly, G2 was a really good team at doing that too, because no one had the, the advanced the development at that point to, like, basically efficiently give resources to everyone to carry on the map while source are drafting them carries and stuff like that, because if everyone's pushing lanes and, like, it's, someone's always going to get overextended and ganked, Weirdly, of course, last last worlds, T1 won playing exactly that style. Everyone's pushing lanes. Everyone's playing like big damage carries. There's overloaded damage across the board. But like super teams were like a really hard nut to crack for forever. Alliance were one of meant to be Alliance back in season four were called like the super team and they couldn't work out at first. And like this was like a big problem which League had to crack over time. And like before that, the, the loads of those teams were just ones which just detracted from each other, even they had really good carry players. And like Nowadays is a different kind of situation, but like seeing players who are actively just detracting from each other is one of the my least favorite things in League of Legends. Also, by the way, sorry, I didn't even get to point five. Sorry, <laughs> Naimia. They might just randomly play a different rookie top laner who has oh, the capability God. to be bad at Rumble. So there we go. We'll just we'll just throw that one out there. They so said they, it couldn't they, be done. They, 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 there's point five. Just 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 in case you thought the the fucking. KT Millennium Puzzle didn't have enough fucking vectors of attacks to it. There's another one for you. I despise KT, man. All right. Well, we've spent enough time talking about uh, KT. Let's talk about Gen G because they play D plus again, which is also another rematch from last week. Obviously, uh, they 2 0 D plus. But again, whenever it comes to Gen G, as I said before, I am full on the copium and I will, you know, throw this at you both. D plus did have slight leads in the early games in both of those games so you yeah, know they're not real leads G game two was game two was like they yeah that one was, was that one that one was more real they, they were like right. they were like 11 well, two up so, in kills I'm... so they were winning skirmishes but they threw a nash so yeah but... so i mean but th this is this kills. is exactly what i was saying earlier about t1 in regards to them needing more burst than tank because this team like t1 needs to play around burst i think that um uh d d plus of like they are like the team which plays around short snappy combo based team fights that they are the team which do that and what you see against genji is that when the team fights were about short snappy bursty com uh, team fights 
they can work with that. They're really good at using globals to set those up and catch people out of position too. But as soon as that first combo doesn't solve the fight, Genji are much better at playing around longer team fights. Like, so much better. They are way better at, like, using their second round of cooldowns. They're way better at finding, uh, maintaining their shape when they disengage from a player as well. And they're good at surviving using just enough cooldowns that they have excess cooldowns for the second round of the fight as well. So, like, they're not, like, throwing shit out for free and then, like, they don't have those to use in the second round of it. So... That's, like, the big thing between these teams. It's, like, can Genji get to the point, which, and which they do very frequently, can they stop D, um, D plus getting, like, game-deciding plays off of their short combo so they can play towards a longer style of um, fight, which is, they just massively just leave D plus in the, in the dust. And the first time, pretty much, in that game to you where the combo doesn't work out, Genji used the second round of cooldowns, and it's just, like, game over beyond that point. So that was the big thing which I picked up from that series. Um, but like, I, I will say, I think D plus are, are playing way better than I thought they would. I think that they're using globals and teleports really, really well. They have multiple kinds of, um, combos as well. Um, yeah, so I mean, like, that, that series was, was good. That second game was really good. But that's basically the flowchart I see happening in the, uh, happening in that series. And we'll see whether that's the same next time it comes up. Yeah, as I sort of mentioned before, like, in, in game two especially, they were... And to your point about sort of the, the shorter engagements versus the extended ones, they were getting lots of quick, successful skirmishes mm. early. And then whenever a play would drag out beyond that in the mid game, obviously you got a bit more concern. I do still think that game kind of came down to that butched play at Nash though, where then um, Chovy's able to chase and gets like a three man's Emperor's Divide or whatever. Like that, you know, did obviously sort of, quote unquote throw the game at the same time do i still think that Gen G probably would have found a way back into that game because the lead wasn't like so astronomical probably but again guys we have to look at it from the perspective of where are Gen G ever going to drop games not series games and that was definitely an opportunity at least to win a solitary game so kira a d plus gonna win a game this week against Gen G. like of teams that can do it they are like one of the more favored teams um, you know, but if you look at the laws of averages, most likely, like, P a Paves like Hens aren't going to, like, play as poorly as they did in the second game, you know, are you as likely to get Chovy doing that to you as on, on his ear all the time? No, but I don't think those really balances out, like, I've seen, like, I feel like Chovy's ability to command, like, being good, is way more regular than like Paves and stuff like just like running it down. Like they're like outweigh that. I'm more. I think it's way more likely that Paves and Lehens will go back to being like will play very good games, and Chovy will also continue to just be very good rather than like I think that's going to be a continuation of like form for Paves and Lehens because the the whole that whole like lead is predicated on like the bot side with the Lulu Zeri um into the like center, um, you know. You also, like, you've got to watch as, like, teams ever-expanding, like, champion pool. Uh, one of the dangerous things to ever give a team that's very, 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 very good at, like, farming and keep a stable match is globals. Uh, particularly, like, like globals, um, not, like, that are, like, a, like, GP, like, with, like, GP out, where they're, like, Oh yeah, the GP is just randomly. By the way, D plus and Jedi will one hundred percent scrub each other because they just randomly pick yeah. up the gangplank. By the way, <laughs> but like it, it's it, and what I mean like I say this about globals, I mean like true globals, not globals like me and Nymeria were talking about, where you mm. can affect a team from far away. I mean like genuinely, he can drop a like out on like Galio. Like yeah. Yeah. yeah, like literally, you can just do it from anywhere on the map. You just like GP out the place. So. If like that's like the nature of Gen G, then that's where they continue to fall. I find that version of Gen G is way harder for DK to beat than like the Senna like Cassante Death Ball one. I think that's actually one of the best. Like that if Gen G is ever playing Senna, that's actually one of the most like fragile comps to like beat Gen G on because you can get like such early acceleration in, and if you've got like the players. The DK do of like that quality, they can like they're great at front running. For all of his flaws, Showmaker and Aiming and Kingen are all very very good at front running. They they are. It was just unfortunate, you know, like Chovy gets his big moment, changes the entire mm. outlook in the game. 
Yeah, I, I will say, I think that aiming has finally graduated from Zeri Rehab. <laughs> like, this guy can actually play other stuff now, I think. The Zeri's still his best champion in a lot of ways, but I, I'm happy to see him on other stuff again. Like, this isn't the aiming that we're seeing in Spring that was kind of, like, quite consistently getting himself into shit spots. So, I wonder if that opens up. So, the way that we saw Genji get really, really rattled before um, by top esports was... Um, when they had such a powerful first pick comp that Lahens couldn't position the way that he wanted to. And if you then play, so yeah, for instance, that's I, that's I think- That's one way of putting it, yeah, Nibira. <laughs> it is, but I but think so, but like, when you have a combination like Ash Braum, which then just catches out of Fog of War, regardless where on the map, and then suddenly like, Braum is not easy, it's not easy to land his big CC, but if he does do the knock up and the slow, and then the Q into the stun is an insane amount of weirdly base damage, because Braum has huge base damages from based on like his HP and shit. Um, and then also, like, the CC duration is absolutely massive on top of an Ash Arrow. It means that, like, if you catch Lahens out as the first target and you really hammer Lahens, I think that before we've said, hey, look, LCK teams, they don't pressure mid enough. That is definitely something. But if you pressure Lahens particularly and you force just force him down into a point where he has zero gold, he's died on cold, and he has no XP and no gold, I think that Lahens can be a bit of a liability to the point where, like, I wonder whether Aiming and Kellen should pick out, like, Ash Braum stuff and just be like, okay, we are playing for the first combo. Lahens, you are not getting to move. You get to just, like, you, you're just going to immediately die. It works with the first pick combo that the team's really, really good at. If you lock it in with, like, I don't know, like, Sejuani Talir or something like that, that's completely fine. Then you have Braum, Sejuani, Ash Lear, both really fun fun with that team. King and Sidi do whatever the hell he wants with whatever kind of bruiserish top laner he wants as well. I feel like that potentially could throw Genji for a bit of a loop because... What we've no what I've noticed Genji doing now is because they've going they're going less towards the carry jungles for Canyon. Going much more towards like the um maintenance jungle support. So Sejuani so Rakan, stuff which is just like fine and lane, can maintain lanes which are scaling. Genji are playing fully for scaling lanes right now with like the game uh, that like they're going back towards the Azir, they go well, I mean everything that sure, um um everything that like um sherby has been playing has been scaling, and a lot of what, what Keen's been playing has been scaling as well. Like it just allows them to it's not, weirdly, it's not dissimilar to the way that Rogue, there's like the ideal form of what Rogue would have long, what, liked with that, with that roster. Yeah, it's what they for. Where it's like, well, that's, that is, like, for, that, that yeah. is like the ultimate golden dream for them. It's like, oh my god, all lanes are getting huge value just by keeping farming and turning up to team fights later, but like your jungle support, just like maintain everything and make sure there is a status quo where you just keep getting resources. Like, if you take... Um, if you take Lahens out of that equation by just really hard focusing on him, I think you can then get to the lanes beyond that point. What we've seen is sometimes teams go too heavily into the lanes first, and because Canyon um, and Lahens are so quick on the roam, and they're so good at spotting the next play coming, they're pretty much going to counter you if you directly go to the lanes. I think you actually go after Lahens first, like a great first pick combo, you kill him first, and hopefully that leaves something open on the map, so you, then you can go to the lanes after that point. So... Maybe that's the way to do things, but the problem is with Genji is that like they have so many hero players that even if you get under their skin the first time, it is not realistically going to happen for you know long periods in a game and also like a full series. So that's gonna be rough. And I don't know whether we're gonna see like an instant heal turn from from D plus to get towards that. I think we're likely gonna see like Eamon and Kellen going still towards their same kind of stuff, more Zeri Pro or whatever. I, I wonder if they pick up some of those other things, maybe it'll work out better for them. Yeah, so I think it was interesting though what Kira said of like he doesn't expect Pays Lehens necessarily to play that badly again. One of the narratives I think coming or one of the more recent narratives certainly ahead of the Esports World Cup was that, you know, maybe we've always just been a bit unfair on Pays and Lehens and maybe actually they do belong in like the sort of higher echelon of uh bot are lanes. they the best bot lane but, in the world sure but i think that was also like a massive removal from what our previous opinions were of them which was they're fine but they're not special is this actually just a regression to the norm because again obviously i know jackie love and mako for me as i've said i think they are the best bot lane in the world despite whatever top esports recent troubles might be but that series and then the series against d plus where obviously kellen's had a fantastic uh, split so far and aiming's been pretty damn good as well like i don't necessarily think it was a whoopsie from pays lehens i think it's on the cards that in any given series aiming and kellen can just outperform them so for me like do you not think that's potentially just like a win con just to win through bot given their re given pays and lehens recent form i yeah, will try that yeah, well, hmm. y yes and no. I think that sometimes, like, we we've seen that Paisley Hens are pretty good at, like, getting the most... Like, 
I don't think that it's easy to get under Paisley Hens with like uh get 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 ahead of them with like early dominant lanes. Weirdly, T1 have tried doing that quite a lot, and I feels like Paisley Hens have withstood that pressure. You need something that really like is yes. So, so again, I really think that you just go like for like stuff like Ash lanes or something which is more utility, which like have good laning phases, but then as soon as you start moving out onto the map, they can randomly pick you off. I think pick bot lanes maybe work better for them. And again, just try and hard focus on Lahens on the roam because that's where he's occasionally shown weakness, and that might be the thread which pulls things apart. It, it's. I don't think you're necessarily getting much out of them through laning phase right now. I think they've solidified that up a lot better than they have done in the past. So I think you have to shift the 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 scope of this to just outside of lane when you're first going on the roam. I mean, hey, we're always grasping at straws when Whitley, it comes Whitley, to Genji. Bra Whitley, so. Whitley Bard might also be okay at that too, because Bard's pretty good at that kind of style play too, even though I hate the fucking champion. But <laughs> hey, it's there. Well, I'm just going to put my... Uh, five. I'm going to put my cards on the table and say, this is it, guys. This is when a team does get a game. Not a series, but a game. I'm going to say that Genji win 2-1. I think that uh, a combination of uh, my boy Showmaker... And uh, the bot lane, they're gonna the back line this time is gonna get something done. They're gonna win a game. But um, right. are you guys both going two zero, Genji? I would assume. Yeah, like I, that is what I think is gonna happen. Like I do, I do think they're favored to win every game. So I think yeah, two zero. Yeah, but okay. Let me just push back a tiny bit on this as a philosophy, though, Kira, because I think the, I mean, obviously, statistically, I would assume you you are correct, but all you're really saying is in any given single game. No, but like, the the, it's team. a consistency of BLG. Like, for example, I mm. think BLG, like, like even though they are most likely to win every series, I do not think they are most likely to do it to one because of the inconsistency of their players. The thing is, is like, Genji have shown an unbelievable level of consistency. That's fair, and I yeah. think, right, so like, when they lost, okay, for example, see when they lost to get against TES, right? I wasn't actually that surprised when they lost uh, TES, I think, even though I did say it's somewhat paradoxical, but because... Yeah, like I think it was eventually like more likely to happen than like than not, and the nature of like going out there, um, the tournament. If you look at like what Genji was like picking and stuff like that in the games. However, I, if you would have said sat me down and be like, okay, who's gonna? If this was a Bo five, who would have won it? I would have still said Genji. I would have still thought Genji was going to like like beat them because the sample size of like their performance is like I'm basically saying that like, uh, um. <coughs> Like, you know, BLG, like, say against, like, the mid, like, upper mid-level teams, BLG have, like, a 70 to 80% chance to win any given game. That means across, like, a BO3, most likely, they are, it's not insane for them to lose, like, one game, okay? But Gen G, like, against, like, these this level team, I think you're all the way up at, like, 90s. Like, they're really, they are that different in terms of the, the consistency. Like, it is no fault of, like, um... The, the game where um, Genji, they, you know, uh, a D plus or ahead, like Chovy makes that big massive like yeah. play. That is why you have Chovy. Like that is why Chovy is there. Like Chovy is there because he can see those big massive plays, and he's unbelievably consistent in lane, and he has a champion pool option. It's like it's not the uh, people put like the cart before the horse. Where like the reason Genji is so hard to beat is because majority of games they front run you, and when they front run you, you never win. You you don't win those games. Then you have all the games where you lead into them, but your lead's not that big. Yeah, by the way, in those games you're not winning, you're behind, you've got to go faster, right? So you've all, they, all those games are already lost. Then you've got all the games where it's like a decent lead and most teams would close it out. And in those games, those are the games like your star players, like Canyon, Chove, King, yeah. even Lehens if he's unengaged, they can like bail you out the five, six K gold deficit games. It's those games oh, yeah. are the only ones that are threatening of losing. Yeah, but yeah, I know. I think specifically in that skill set when they're in that position too, this is something which like amazes me about the team. I love watching Gen G doing like the feigned retreat team fights or like, I okay, guess these two part yeah. team fights with Gen G are so freaking good at well there was a game uh msi i, I can't remember if it's against top esports i think canyon was on maokai and it's like he, they initially are getting caught by some pick cc or something like that they don't panic they are very quick to reorganize their battle lines and someone just about escapes the pick and as soon as the enemy team then tries to like follow up and try and finish that pick off they have just enough cooldowns left because they're really good at like efficiently using their cooldowns to escape situations to re-engage and win the fight. Because they're really good at like conserving cooldowns for the perfect moment in that second part of the fight where maybe the enemy team's missed out on one. Well, like, realistically, the reason they lost at EWC is because Top East was very, again, just as efficient at using those cooldowns offensively because they were hitting Ash Braum, Ash Braum combos like really nutty 
kind of like damage onto the hens at that point. Even then, that was a close series. So like, I don't know. When whenever you you need to be so precise against them, you can't afford to misuse cooldowns. Otherwise, team just like this team will outvalue with the cooldowns they have left. It's insanely impressive to watch. Here's like a like an interesting like thing for you. I I feel like start shadow boxing. Let's say I take I take Katie, and I put them into. T1, for example. I can talk about Deft and Beryl. They can play, like, Ash, um, Enchanter bot lanes uh, into, like, Korea and Guma to, like, find wins. Mm. Uh, BDD has, like, a variety of different, like, mages he can play into, like, Faker and Assassins that might he might opt into to be able to, like, kill F uh, Faker and to, like... I can start talking about, like, these angles for, like, um, for, like, KT. The problem is, is when you, like, sh outside, like, the bot lane, where there is, like, some angles, and I do agree, they, like, do exist, but overall... They, like their consistencies all blew up. Like shadow boxing people against Keen, even all the way back in KT is just like it's like Zeus on counter pick or like pretty much bust. And then like anyone against like Chove, like I don't know why anyone thinks like the first fifteen minutes of the game, like like Chove is just it's insane. Like I, I don't I don't know why anyone like would pretend otherwise. And so when you have that plus like Canyon behind you, it's like Canyon's only weakness right now, if you want to even call about it and talk, is like he sometimes misevaluates what side of like the game is going to be accelerated on, which is like for every other jungler that is also mainly a weakness outside of like prime like Kanave, who was like godlike on godlike at it on like JDG. So that that that's where we're, that's what we're kind of talking about here. Um, I don't know, like they're super hard to beat. Like what for me, Rich? Like what do you think? Like in terms of like the like what do you think? Like the the win from D plus looks like. So this is the thing. I think what happens when you have a team that's as good as Gen G is typically when you're analyzing like what a win con is from the other team, you mm -hmm. are starting with the good team and saying what they're not going to do. So basically over the spectrum of how, I don't know what the total number of games is that they play to round robin best of threes or whatever but obviously gen g will play fewer because they go to less game threes right so let's yeah. just call let's just call it like 26 games or something i don't know how many it is but let's just say it's like 26 yep. games basically you're anticipating that they're being humans slash their <laughs> levels of concentration or whatever yep. they'll be like let's say four games where enough players on gen g dip that they become susceptible to another team if they play really fucking well and they have to play really fucking yeah. well because that's how good Gen G are, will be in a position to beat them and then are any of those games closed out or whatever. So I am anticipating that this is a good part of the season. It's not sufficiently close to playoffs. It's also not sufficiently close to the beginning of the season. And it's right. coming off, you know, relatively recent disappointment at EWC that this is a good day to snipe Gen G being in dips and then obviously but, the but they then just beat them yeah but again that, but, that, but no that, that play that makes it more likely they'll be beaten i think i think it'll play into okay the you think that makes it more likely? yeah i think it makes okay. it more likely right if, okay. oh, mate, if d plus had beaten gen g they would have zero percent chance of doing it again like if they really? somehow yeah i okay. i think so i think they would have no oh, right. other than the fact that they've shown that they could do it you know like i think they would want to shove this down their throat and be like get back in your lane you know i i i think that the fatigue of playing the same team like back to back um and coupled with the fact that they're in bang in the middle of like regular season best of threes this is the most vulnerable they'll be every game like let's fast forward like three weeks right so it's like you're approaching the last couple of weeks before playoffs or whatever like every game beyond this point realistically is going to be increased importance until the end of the year essentially mm -hmm. right for a team like yep. G. so I and I think we can largely dispel the most of the choky narratives around this team. So I think this is like as good an opportunity. You want to get a really good team to play against them at a moment where the stakes aren't particularly high and they're in the midst of like, you know, a, a potential fatigue wall let's say again a lot of this is hypothetical they might be just as motivated as they were week one who knows but i think this is actually i could see them slipping here i could see the concentration dropping by the way no matter what happens i think they'll win the series but i could see you know game two maybe I game like, one like... particularly easy and game two they just you know a few of them just turn their brains off a little bit and my no, boy shot like pops ones. off I like this new one, Rich. Concentration. This is good. I like this one. I'm gonna take it. I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna use this concentration. I'm gonna apply it to Fnatic so that they can blow up Nexus better. 
gonna be good. So nah, fanatic, I, fanatic I, had, just have... I had Fnatic are concentrating really well this week. No, no. Like, they, they can't actually get humanoid away from the computer. No, but see, the, the problem with Fnatic is they actually <laughs> have diagnosed ADHD on all five <laughs> members of the team. So that's, you know, maybe not Jun, but you know, that's that's uh, not really comparable. Whereas this is just a natural blip to show that the members oh, of Gen G okay. aren't supermen. That's it. That's that's the difference, you know. So yeah. I'm gonna say two one. By the way, I actually like, want them to lose because it's funner to talk about Gen G and in terms of losses than it is because like the way they win is just so like I want them to lose because yeah. I don't I don't want to like begrudge them any success. I think this team, like because of how good they are and all the rest of it, they deserve to win things. So I do think they should win, you know, a chunk of things. I want that for them. But I don't want this team to go down as like the greatest team ever or whatever because I I'm I'm they're not that interesting to me. There's just so Whoa, bro, they're so interesting. No, I oh, I so so put, it, put it this way. Put it this way. They are not the most flashy team to ever exist. Yeah. And they're like they they don't play like sexy league of legends they play good yes, great efficient exactly. league of legends which is really cool and i have to say i like i i have i i have a real adoration for the beauty of some of the team fights that they do and like the way they play around frontline but like exactly yeah, realistic, you know realistically like for for a layman's for from like a regular point of view and for like an excitement point of view people prefer to watch like the JDG explosive team fights, the T1 yeah. scrappy skirmishes, then Jay. No, they then, don't, Jamie. They're all they, liars. They don't like watching those fights. They do. They, they love do. it. And, and you know, and <laughs> you know what? It, and, and you know what? It shows in the viewer numbers. Yes, too. exactly. It does. Yeah. It's, it's, it's one of the like, reasons well, why, like, Origin and Rogue, like, like even, even when Origin and Rogue were good teams in the LE, in the LC, EU LCS slash LEC, they never got, like, anywhere it says their branding because they played fucking boring League of Legends. I think Gen.G plays still very good League of Legends. And I think that yes. Shovey in particular is so interesting to watch. Um, particularly Chovy, and I think that Canyon when he's on great, uh, like his his character as well is insane. But like that, they don't play like the high flare League of Legends, which is why people <laughs> yeah. sometimes are avert, averted against them, which is a bit of a shame. Yeah, it's it's like, like the same way like some people don't like Djokovic's style of play in tennis because he's not Federer. He doesn't play beautiful tennis. Yeah, <laughs> Here, here's a dichotomy for you, and this and this is something that is like true of like all like, that. If I was to say that, like people, that's hard for people's brains, right? Okay, I would say like who's the more like like if you were to say oh. Chovy's boring because he's so like passive and then when someone says that to you who's like watched lots and loads of Chovy I was like what do you mean like Chovy's more aggressive in lane than night like yeah. <laughs> Chovy's like one of the oh, most no, I, no, that's, 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 that's a hangover from previous years that's yeah. people who yeah, but, like, this is, that's... but this is the problem with like viewing some of the great players in regions where people just don't it's like an, an LEC or an LCS fan where like oh but he's so passive it's like yeah maybe like when you watched him in Worlds like two years ago or something like mm. when he couldn't really get the most out of sidelines that he wanted to like he's not that now <laughs> but here's, here's the ultimate comparison okay because as we've talked about this is a good versus exciting right all mm. very very recent bias aside okay bds are better at league than fanatic but if someone said I'm one back. of these two <laughs> teams <laughs> one of these two teams will go down as the greatest ever like western team who do you want it to be i'd be like fanatic because they're explosive they're fun oscar and in can lose to fucking finn and then beat 369 like it's it's fun to watch you know razork is a fucking and humanoid a psychopath sometimes they're insane and play like absolutely on the edge of League of Legends. Sometimes they lo when they lose, they lose in ridiculous ways. Like, oh, I'd much God. rather that brand, that, that's you know. That's true. Fnatic are fun. Yeah, yeah they're, they're a fun, fun team. BDS are like the most fucking boring team imaginable, but I appreciate them because, you know, they they have a real identity and they have sound fundamentals. Gen G, this is the thing. Obviously, it's like people just don't watch Chovy. They're like, he's, he's boring, never plays aggressively, whatever. But ultimately, Gen G are an incredibly good fundamentals team. And I guess that's like my main thing. I rather the flawed, you know, I rather the flawed genius than the gets fucking nine out of 10 across all his uh, disciplines. You know, that's whatever. I don't care. I want to see the 11 out of 10 who's got a one out of 10 personality or something, you know, let's put it yeah, that way. Okay. Uh, anyway, <laughs> right. Wow, let's right. leave it there, guys. Uh, there will be EuroLeague this week, obviously, as well uh, in a couple of days. Where, as I said, Nymera, hopefully by that point, will have caught up on my you know, amazing... Uh, oh, Suzume was it. Stop oh, watching I, Nymera. <laughs> Don't get baited in, Tez. Well, so I, I tell you, I've been watching Durarara really instead good. recently, which is really good. I've been enjoying that a lot. What is? So, what did you say? Durarara. Durarara. It's like a... It, it's good. It's like... You, there's a very famous character from it who is like uh, a, like a, a cyclist with like cat ears on the mo 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 uh, motorbike, but she's basically a headless horseman, but a modern head headless horseman. It's fucking cool. 
Right. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to lie, Nymera. You've not sold me with that little. Uh, it's <laughs> okay. Taste, you don't have to enjoy but, it. I'm enjoying. Uh, I'm enjoying it a lot. I've watched it. There we it go. Watched it for the second time. It's uh, and that's, great. that's all that matters. Uh, right. Anyway, thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you next time.